about propagation given by Massimiliano Vasile. I will put the French okay. All right, good afternoon. And they only schedule my talk right after lunch, so uh, my task is also to keep you awake. I hope you have enough coffee to do to, to attend this talk. Um, so uh, I am uh, Massimiliano Vasile, and uh, I'm from the University of Strathclyde, it is in uh, downtown Glasgow in Scotland. And this is work that I'm doing with um, my PhD student, uh, Carlos Ortega, a colleague, and Melissa Riccardi, and a postdoc uh, fellow, uh, Romain Serra. And it's about uh, the propagation of uncertainty uh, using a technique that, have, that has become uh, popular in recent times, recent, uh, say, probably 10, 15 years. And the talk is not really about dynamical systems and not about celestial mechanics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still here. <laughs> so the question is, um, if you want to propagate uncertainty through a process, a system, like a dynamical system, in most of the, the cases, uh, this community or the community that deals with orbital mechanics uh, use uh, tail expansions. Okay? And therefore, the technique that has become popular is a, a tail based algebra. So we ask ourselves if there was a way to do similar things but with other algebras, not using Taylor, and why Taylor was working and when it was working. And the question came from the fact that if you are doing uncertainty propagation in another field, you don't really want to use Taylor expansions. In fact, Taylor expansions at some point were abandoned because they had properties that were not <coughs> working that well if you do, for example, continuous mechanics. So the talks will say something about uncertainty propagation, and then I will go into uh, how you use algebra in general, polynomial algebra in general, to propagate not even uncertainty, but a generic set uh, from uh, uh, one time to another time if you have a dynamical system. And one question, of course, in this case is, can you actually converge to the actual distribution uh, no matter which algebra you're using? And, and the second question is, what is the computational complexity of this? So is it better to actually use an algebra, so an expansion, for example, of your equations, or is better just to use Monte Carlo? And then I will show some examples that explain what happens if you use an algebra. So what is the problem? The problem is that you have a generic process, which can be a dynamical system, and you have um, some uncertainty, for example, in the states, so again, if you're talking about dynamics, and in some parameters. There can be, for example, the parameters of the model, can be the initial conditions, and what you want is to insert basically this uncertainty in your model and reconstruct the distribution of your output from your model. Okay? That can be, for example, the final state. <coughs> this, of course, is very important. We saw in the, in the talk of Morbidelli that they had to construct a, a probability distribution to understand if there was a planet or not. So you, you need to sometimes to resort to this kind of techniques. And so the idea is, in this cartoon, so you have an initial distribution, which is a spatial distribution in the three-dimensional space, in the six-dimensional space. In fact, what we are trying to do is to look at very high-dimensional spaces. And then you take this spatial distribution and the probability associated with each one of the points in this set, you plug it into the model, and then you look at how the distribution evolves as you insert the distribution into your model. Okay? Now, in most of the cases, this representation or this representation is a polynomial representation. Now, no matter what you do, in the end, what you want to have is a polynomial that describes this region. Okay? So, uh, if you look at the literature on uh, the use of Taylor expansions, uh, you see that uh, a rather popular technique is called Taylor differential algebra. And if you look at a community that does uncertainty propagation and uncertainty quantification, 
Normally, methods to propagate uncertainty are divided into two categories. One is called intrusive methods, because you actually modify uh, the, the, you need to have access to your uh, equations and you modify the equations, or you need to modify the computer code that calculates the quantity that you are interested in. And the other one is non intrusive because you take your model or your process as a black box. Okay? So you have no knowledge of what is inside the box. And this, of course, is particularly interesting uh, when you have computational. Uh, techniques that are a little bit difficult to treat analytically and all when you deal with a company, an industry that has a proprietary software. So one question is, when is it better to use one or the other uh, in terms of time you need to calculate your, your distribution and then if you converge in both cases to the actual distribution. Okay? So this means that I want to be sure that I'm converging to the correct distribution when I'm at this stage. So uh, let's say that I don't know which algebra I want to use. I just want to use n algebra. And this means that I don't want to use necessarily Taylor polynomials. I want to use any type of polynomial. And this is quite useful because uh, in some cases, some polynomials have properties that are very interesting when you propagate uncertainty. So in terms of uh, who tried to use these techniques, uh, probably everything started with Epstein and this idea of ultra arithmetic. And the initial idea was actually to uh, capture one particular type of uncertainty, that is numeric uncertainty, and have a, a bound on the error of your propagated state. In that case, it's a very nice type of uncertainty in a way because it's generally very small compared to what we're propagating. Okay? So it's not what is normally called severe uncertainty. Okay? It's very contained. So you can actually have an expansion, and that's what Bertz proposed. You can have an expansion around your predicted state okay? and study the neighborhood of that predicted state. Now, more recently, uh, Armelin and Delizia uh, basically found many applications of this in celestial mechanics or in orbital dynamics, and did a lot of work on developing uh, filters or propagators, uh, so a lot of very interesting stuff. Um, I, I believe more or less in parallel, in Barcelona, Angel developed the, the jet uh, propagation uh, or jet transport technique, which is, again, a table type of expansion, because you are expanding with respect to a particular point. And then, we tried to develop something that was not using Taylor, and we found the work of uh, Joel Dash from CNRS, who basically did her thesis on the use of Chebyshev polynomials, and demonstrated that at least in one dimension, in a one dimensional case, you can have a very nice approximation using an algebra based on Chebyshev instead of Taylor. Okay, so can we extend all the machinery that is developed for Taylor to any polynomial, and can we recover some of the properties of these polynomials? Okay, so the idea is we want to uh, model a representation of a function with a polynomial, and this polynomial is a function of some uh, parameters, some variables that in this case I don't even define as stochastic variables. So as you can see, this is not necessarily a stochastic space, it can be any space, but in the case of uncertainty, it's a stochastic space. And my representation, of course, is truncated at a certain point, so I have a reminder, and is a polynomial with a generic basis. Okay? So I do not want to specify basically this basis, and I want to uh, insert any basis depending on the property I want and find the parameters here. Now, if you do this kind of expansion, the number of terms that you are uh, generating in general, and that's the size of your algebra, is a factorial function of the dimension of your problem and the number of terms, the degree of the polynomials that you are using. And this is quite important because if you look at this, if you don't do any truncation, Basically, the number of terms increases exponentially, factorially, with uh, the dimension of your problem. Okay? So if you work in six dimensions, it is relatively fine. If you try to add other dimensions, it's not so fine. Now, what are the properties that I need to have? Well, first of all, what I want 
is that if I have uh, a number of operations among functions, okay, the approximation that I can obtain applying the same algebraic operator among polynomials that represent those functions give me an approximation of the operations among functions. Okay? And so I can obtain basically a good approximation um, uh, with a, a, an expansion okay, that I can keep constant. And that's the, the other key, key uh, element. So I want to have always the same number of terms even if I'm multiplying, for example, two polynomials. Okay? I always retain the, the same number of terms. So this is just a definition. I mean, uh, the elements uh, belong to a polynomial ring in, in D determinates and have a degree up to N, which is the degree of the polynomial up to N. So I can define a number of operations. Of course, I have addition that is fairly easy, and uh, the addition is simply the addition of the coefficients. For the case of the multiplication, which is the expensive operation, what I want is to first take whatever basis I have and translate that into monomial basis. Okay? Because if you multiply two monomial basis, you get again another basis within the algebra. So I transform basically whatever basis I have into a monomial basis. And again, what I'm saying here is that I'm truncating my expansion always to have the same uh, order. So I have a number of terms that is controlled. So this is just the definition of uh, how I want to um, uh, um, have my multiplication between two terms. Uh, so once I have the uh, expansion in monomials, I multiply the, the monomials, and I again get a polynomial which is uh, again in the same algebra. Okay, so if I have this machinery that is now independent of the type of polynomial, what can I do? Well, one thing is to look at the properties of some of the bases. So if I use Taylor bases, one thing that we realized is that, first of all, a polynomial developing Taylor basis is not always convergent and is not everywhere convergent. Okay? So there is a radius of convergence of this uh, expansion, but even in that case, I'm not guaranteed to have convergence to the right function. If I use if I use Chebyshev, the, the interesting property is that is uh, giving me a global representation and is always convergence with this uh, near minimax approximation. It doesn't have to be uh, infinitely differentiable, but I only need to have a linear Lipschitz continuous function. I'm not trying to sell you the use of Chebyshev. Huh? I'm just trying to explain the reason why we wanted to have a different type of uh, parameterization. Now, the, the interesting thing of using Taylor, and that was the idea originally of that, is that you don't have the problem that you have with intervals, that when you propagate the intervals, the size of the interval might increase. Okay? But the drawback is that you don't really control the uh, radius of convergence of your Taylor expansion. So you are not 100% sure where your Taylor expansion is converging. Okay, so just a reminder, what I have is my uh, uh, now set of polynomials, and what I do is overload the operators of my computer with operations among polynomials instead of operations among real numbers, and what I need to do is to take every elementary function and I expand each elementary function into a polynomial okay, of a certain degree. Once I have this expansion, I start doing my operations, and I plug this into the dynamic model. And the other important property that an algebra must have is that the composition of H composed F must correspond to the uh, composition also of the polynomials, because otherwise, if you try to plug in this uh, uh, expansion into a, an integrator, you end up having a step of integration that is giving you a polynomial that doesn't correspond to the actual integration of your dynamical system. Okay, so the first question is, of course, if I am expanding every single uh, function into a polynomial, and I put this into a numerical integrator to propagate my uncertainty through the dynamic, does this converge all the time? And where does this converge? So, in order to 
proof convergence, that was one thing that we did recently, we took a dynamical system because that was the interest. We assumed that the initial conditions were a function of some uncertain parameter, and that's the uncertainty space. And then <coughs> we had to define a numerical integrator and see if for that numerical integrator we had convergence to the required final state. In order to demonstrate that, uh, I just want to recall the stone bystrass theorem that basically says that if you have a complementary space, a generic space in this case x, in our case is the uncertainty space u, and we have an algebra okay, on, on uh, real value functions that need to be continuous in, in this case, uh, that contains constant function and separates points in x, then this algebra is dense in uh, this complementary space uh, of continuous function. Now, this is a prerequisite for our convergence theory for a generic algebra to actually converge to the right representation of the uncertainty uh, domain. So, if we have that our uncertainty uh, variables belong to a complementary space, so this is now the uncertainty space, there must be a complementary space, and we have an algebra of polynomials that respect that theorem, and we now plug that uh, polynomial representation into a dynamical system, and we have an integrator that is explicit in time and is marching forward. Okay? So this is now my, uh, for example, simple Euler integrator. This is an example with a, with a Euler integrator in which I am taking f and I'm expanding this into my algebra. And I need to calculate at every step the next uh, uh, state that is now expressed as a polynomial. Then I have to take this plug it in again in this and calculate the polynomial at the next step. Okay? So you see here that I need this composition property because otherwise if I plug a polynomial here and I calculate a polynomial here and then I plug it in again, I have a divergence just because it's not satisfying the composition rule. What I want to uh, prove is that at a certain uh, integration step k, okay, Provided that this integrator is stable, okay? so I'm not uh, in the case in which the, the integrator is not able to integrate the differential equations anyway, no matter whether I use real numbers or polynomials, then I want to demonstrate that this is converging to the actual distribution of the states at a certain time. So what Annalisa managed to do, uh, managed to uh, provide this uh, simple demonstration, but it's three pages, but is a really simple demonstration that uh, if this property is satisfied on the initial conditions, okay, so if the representation with polynomials for a certain degree of the polynomial okay, is arbitrarily close to the actual distribution of the state, the initial state, then at a certain integration step k plus 1, when I increase the order of the polynomials, I am converging to the exact function, the exact solution. Okay? And this is, again, due to the fact that the Weisler's stone uh, theorem, translated into human language, means that it, you can converge with any, well, with a polynomial that uh, respect the properties of the Weisler's uh, stone theorem, you can converge to any continuous function in a, a given domain. Okay, so we know that if we have a certain property, then we have the right algebra that gives us the right approximation. Again, if I look back to the Taylor polynomial that I want to use, for example, for my approximation, I have some, some problems, uh, again, identifying where it is converging. For example, if I take uh, the expansion of log 1 plus x, what happens is that within the interval, uh, sorry, is minus one, uh, one, uh, then that thing is actually converging. So you increase the order of the polynomial and you converge to the right function. But outside that uh, interval, if you increase the, num the degree of the polynomial, you're actually diverging. Okay? And this is a, a phenomenon similar to the 
Lungest phenomenon when you try to approximate a function with a polynomial. So you increase the order you expect to convert better, but instead you increase the, the error instead of the So in fact, you have only a, a small uh, fraction of, uh, of functions that are uh, convergent uh, in, in, if you expand them in the Taylor series. And you have also situations in which the Taylor expansion doesn't converge to the, the function that you're trying to approximate. And this is the case of this simple example uh, that you can find also on Wikipedia. Okay, and I will show something that uh, is probably a manifestation of this phenomenon in the case of a real problem. Now, the, the other question is, is it better to use an algebra to propagate my uncertainty, or is it better to take just some samples uh, from my initial conditions, integrate with a normal integrator without any overloading of the operators. I take the samples at the end of my integration, and with those samples, I construct a polynomial, okay? With any interpolator I want. Okay, so my PhD students managed to demonstrate a couple of uh, lemmas that are quite interesting. So he managed to, to get an uh, estimation of the uh, number of floating point operations that you need to perform when you actually do the multiplication between two uh, generic polynomials and a generic algebra. And it's interesting because the number of floating point operations is dependent on two times the, 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 the dimension of your uncertainty space. And if you then add uh, to this, the fact that you are integrating forward in time, um, you can, um, of course, approximate the <coughs> complexities, the number of the point iteration, with a function of the exact size of the algebra, uh, which is an upper limit. And then if you plug this into the total number of integration steps that you need to perform, you have an estimation of the total complexity of your propagation of uncertainty forward in time, which again is a function of the number of steps. These are the number of operations that you need to perform to evaluate the right-hand side of your dynamical system. And this again is the size of the algorithm. Okay? So this estimation was quite important for us because if you try to compare this complexity just by looking at the runtime, the implementation, the computer that you're using, the CPU that you're using are coming into play. So this means that if you're using different computers, maybe you are uh, finding that one particular method is better than another. But if you just look at the number of floating point operations, it's independent of the type of machine that you're using and also the type of implementation. So what happens if you are just propagating samples with a normal integrator and then you're trying to construct a polynomial on the other side? Well, in this case, you still have the number of operations to evaluate the right-hand side of your dynamical system. You have the number of integration steps. But then when you are on the other side, so at the end of the propagation, assuming that you have a number of samples that is equal to the size of the algebra, Okay, so the, the, you have a, a polynomial that is of the same order, in the same number of dimensions. You generally have to perform a matrix inversion. Okay? And this matrix inversion has a computational cost that is uh, NQ. Okay, so this is the cost that you need if you are not using an algebra, and this is the cost that you, that you need if you are using an algebra. Taylor algebra doesn't matter. You can put this on a nice graph in which you have the dimension of your uncertainty space and we went up to 50 dimensions because we were interested in something that was more than just initial conditions. And this is the complexity of the right-hand side of your dynamical system. So below this curve, this is the order of expansion of your polynomial. Below this curve, it's more convenient to use a, a, an algebra. Above this curve, it's more convenient that you just propagate samples. Okay? So this is quite interesting for us because it means that it's not always true, regardless of the implementation of the machine, that you always use an expansion. Okay? Sometimes it's, it's much better if you don't try to overload anything and you just use a simple integrator. Okay, so let me now uh, show you some examples of how uh, this algebra can be used in uh, 
uh, this time orbital mechanics. Okay, so we recover a little bit of physics here. So the first thing that we did was a very simple experiment, and we said, okay, we have uh, a, a dynamical system which is an orbital uh, uh, dynamic, dynamic problem in which we have uh, uh, some drag here, a thrust, and a simple body problem, and then we have some unmodeled component that we consider a generic interval uh, without any specific distribution. And of course, then we have a mass consumption here. So we have these two equations. And we have the initial conditions that are unknown, but then we can have any other, uh, sorry, the initial conditions are uncertain, but then we can have any other uh, type of uncertainty, for example, in CD, A, uh, Epsilon, T, Alpha. So we, we try to play with different type of uncertainty. Okay, so we define uh, some intervals for the initial conditions and for some of the parameters that uh, we, we have for our model. We use an exponential model for, for drag because it was very simple. Again, we don't want to be physically accurate here, but we want to see what the effect is in, in this case if we propagate with, uh, with the algebra. So we studied different cases and some of them are rather complex because we went up to 10 model parameters that are uncertain. Okay, So we wanted to have a problem that was dimensionally larger than just the six uh, initial conditions. Um, this just to give you an idea of uh, uh, some of the values that we use and uh, the dimension of our uh, uncertainty space, if you add all the uncertainty parameters plus initial conditions, uh, went up to a maximum of 17 parameters. Okay? So it's fairly substantial um, uncertainty space. We use a runge kutta fourth order uh, fixed set step size integrator, and we integrate it for uh, an arbitrary length of time to see how the uncertainty region was evolving. Now, one thing that we had to be sure of was that the uh, technique using the algebra was giving the same accuracy of the techniques that was not using the algebra, so the technique in which I just integrate samples and then I reconstruct it for you. So we had to tune basically the number of samples and the degree of the algebra to have more or less the same error. So you see here, this is the reference error, which is the algebra, and we want the non-intrusive approach that is close to the result of the algebra. Otherwise, it would have been a non-fair uh, comparison. This is just the orbit, but it is not particularly uh, meaningful. And this is how the error in all the states evolves uh, if you try to represent the state with the algebra and you try to represent the state with just sampling and then reconstructing a polynomial on the other side. Okay? So we were fairly sure that we were more or less in the same ballpark in terms of error. Okay? Not exactly the same, but similar. Now what happens if you look at the runtime, and this was the, the verification that we wanted to have, is that the runtime of the algebra for almost the same accuracy at some point as a, as a crossing point okay, in terms of dimensionality. And again, this means that we are in that case in which if we are below or above the curve, it's better to use one technique or the other technique. So this experiment confirmed that, in fact, it's not always better to use, for example, in this region, it's not better to use the algebra because it's more expensive for the same accuracy. Okay? While here, it becomes convenient to use the algorithm. And in fact, if you look at the time used to generate the polynomial by the sampling, what happens is that if you increase the number of dimensions, the majority of the time is spent into inverting the matrix at the other end that, that you need to calculate the coefficients of the polynomial, okay? which has a, a cubic uh, uh, expansion, uh, sorry, um, cost with the dimension of the algorithm. Uh, the number of um, so if we look then at the graph, the theoretical graph, we found out that for the case that we analyzed, in fact, we have a good match and we are moving along this line for a particular degree of expansion of our algebra. So the theory in this case was matching fairly well the computational cost uh, of, the, um, of, of the propagation. 
So then we try to use this to actually solve the real case. And the real case in this case <laughs> was a problem that Isa posed and was the propagation of uncertainty during the reentry of uh, the satellite Goche. This uh, work that in fact we did with Space Disk. So Space Disk worked on one thing when we worked on another thing and we experimented with this kind of techniques. So again we have this kind of dynamics and in this case we had to use a fairly accurate um, uh, model, especially for the uh, drug coefficient. Okay? Drug coefficient was modeled a, a bit better than in the previous case. Uh, we studied different uh, situations in which we were propagating for a short or long time, and we had to set up basically the same kind of conditions that were expected for the satellite portion. The initial conditions were defined within a certain interval, and in this case, the uncertainty is rather severe in some cases because, as you can see on the velocity, we have a fairly large error. Sometimes it's, if you have a very poor knowledge of your uh, state due to determination, you might end up in this situation, but generally you try to improve it. So this is the uh, dispersion of all possible positions of Gauche during the reentry phase with that kind of errors. And this is what happens if you use either Chebyshev or Taylor. Okay? So Taylor is expanded with respect to the estimated state of Gauche. And of course, if you abandon the uh, region of convergence of Taylor, what you see is a divergence of the uh, estimation that, uh, provided by the Taylor polynomials. And for the same magnitude of the uncertainty, because Chebyshev has this global convergence on, on the uh, uh, set of uncertainty, instead Chebyshev maintains a reasonable approximation. Okay? So you have here the circles are uh, Monte Carlo, red is Chebyshev, and, and blue is Taylor, for the same uh, computational cost. Okay? So we look also at shorter arcs, and you see here again the, the, this uh, divergence. And then if you try to increase the order of the algebra, here is what can happen. Okay? So you see the phenomenon that I was explaining before. So you try to increase your order because you hope to do better by increasing the, the degree of the polynomial, and instead your polynomial starts diverging. Not everywhere, okay? but in some parts of your domain it starts diverging. So this is the case in which Taylor diverges, and, and in this case, uh, uh, Chebyshev maintains a, a, a good representation, although it doesn't converge as fast as we want. Uh, this is comparing the computational cost. In the case of Chebyshev, we have an extra cost because we have to convert everything into monomial basis. But that step, in, in this case, is not an expensive, computationally expensive step. And the, the final case I want to show and then I conclude, is the case in which uh, propagating something that is developed with respect to a particular point might not be the best idea. And in fact, what we are trying to do now is to propagate a generic region over which we can define a probability distribution which is not unimodal. Okay? That doesn't have that the mean is the, is the most likely value. And that is quite important when you have a swarm of objects, and, and this swarm can evolve and generate more objects. Okay? Because in that case, it's difficult to define the probability, the most likely event within the swarm. So the first thing we did was to use a very simplified uh, model in, uh, in oscillating orbital elements, because we wanted to see if that technique was working in oscillating orbital elements. And then we tried to use the same model that we used for Goche, but for a cloud on the brain. We took a, a generic uh, set of uh, initial conditions with uncertainty on different parameters, including the ballistic coefficient. And it was quite important. Now, in this case, since the orbital parameters are behaving very well, and there are no discontinuities, and nothing is behaving badly, you see here how the cloud debris evolves when you propagate it with Chebyshev and Taylor and Monte Carlo. And, and there is a good match. The two things are very similar. Okay? This is the case in which we are within the region of convergence of the two algebras, and everything evolves very nicely. 
You see the decay of the cloud because of the effect of drag. So this is the article of the apogee, this is the article of the energy. Uh, at, at some point, and I, I, I'm not going to show this, the uh, evolution of the cloud actually breaks because drag becomes so important that some of the cloud, that some of the debris actually continue along the orbit and some others are actually experiencing a, an abrupt gain. Um, so then we, we try to insert a very sophisticated model, exactly as, as for Goche, that is not that smooth. And what happens is that we have, again, a high dimensional, problem, mildly high dimensional problem with uh, good uncertainty on the initial conditions. And again, what happens is that in this case, since the behavior is not as bad as in the case of the, the case of Goja, because we didn't use the same size of the uncertain initial conditions, the two representations are not uh, bad and they are comparable in terms of accuracy. But again, what can happen is this divergence process. Okay? So again, you increase the, the order trying to uh, improve your solution and instead you have to Okay. So, um, now our attempt is to generalize to any uh, polynomial, not just Chebyshev. Chebyshev was quite interesting because it had these very nice properties of global convergence. I'm not trying to sell it. For a number of problems, it's much better to use Taylor because, again, you don't have the problem of defining the interval over which you are expanding uh, your polynomial. But the problem that we realized was that with uh, just Taylor, we had a, a problem identifying the radius of convergence, and, and the uh, convergence was not guaranteed everywhere. So instead, uh, we, we saw that with other types of uh, uh, polynomials, we can have even discontinuities or piecewise uh, um, continuous models and still have a good representation of the final state. And this was the main uh, goal that we wanted to achieve. Okay, I would say that I can stop here if you have any questions. Yeah, that, that is in fact one of the reasons why using Chebyshev provides yes. an advantage. So in, in an article, should, this should be mentioned, I guess. Uh, yeah, in, 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 in a, I, I didn't mention that. It's yeah. a very important property. I, I didn't mention that because I, I mentioned another property which is in a way related to the convergence of orthogonal polynomials. That is that min max convergence everywhere. Uh, but yes, yes, you're right. Regarding the initial conditions and uh, the parameters, uh, uh, it's uh, often not the case uh, really when they are normally distributed. And uh, uh, does it affect your methods? Uh, I mean, uh, are they tied to the fact that uh, the uncertainties are uh, normally distributed or not? No, exactly. That, that was a, a very important point because the difference. <laughs> So the difference between uh, the use of, of Taylor is that you need to have a so-called anchor point from which you expand, okay? And an anchor point uh, generally is wise to be the point at highest probability in your distribution. So if you have a, a unimodal distribution, say like this is not a unimodal, but looks like a unimodal distribution in which the average actually exists, so the average is the most likely point, then you can use that. But if you use another algebra, like Chebyshev, you don't need to do that. You just need to define the uh, borders of your region, 
And whatever is inside that doesn't matter. Yeah? Okay, let's thank Ben.